Hi, everyone. So today I am delighted to be joined by Litmus A. Freeman, who is stepped out of the system. And I'm going to find out more about what that actually means to become a free man. He's also a musician. And I really like his music, genuinely really enjoy his music. And I've been sharing it on CPN. Some of those songs are specific to uh, kind of truth and freedom and singing about, you know, these the, the, the messages that are important regarding regarding freeing ourselves from from the chains all around us. And then finally, uh, Litmus A. Freeman also has created his own calendar. So I'll be interested to hear more about why he's done that and the reasons for that and how that works. So first of all, thank you for joining me here today. Great to be here, man. And, uh, you know, first I'd love to say thanks for all your work and what you do, because it really made a difference through all the scamdemic, you know. So well done on you for that. Thank you. And what we're doing now with these interviews is I'm interviewing people that are kind of famous in this freedom truth movement and people that are behind this, you know, just ordinary folk that we don't normally hear about. We don't hear about their stories and also inviting from the CPN community just to really start bringing everybody together and, and, and realizing that we're all in this together and kind of getting that feeling from the interviews that we do. So I'd love to start with you, if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about your background. So anything you want to share about your background, but also when the awakening was for you or the realization that, you know, the, the, the world out there doesn't really have your best interests at heart. Yeah, all right then, but well, I should start off by putting my normal accent on. <laughs> I was born in Cairdiv, which is known in English as Cardiff. Um, in the country of Cymru, which is known in English as Wales, uh, you know, and, and the, the native language of that area is uh, Cymraeg, which is known in English as Welsh. So um, I'm not a nationalist, um, but I do think it's important to, to kind of know your history and your roots and, and where you came from in this lifetime, you know, in this incarnation. And because that's a big part of the journey that you're on, I think, you know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I grew up in Wales, mostly in, in a place called Barry, which uh, if people have ever seen the BBC thing called Gavin and Stacey, they'll probably know Barry because it's actually kind of filmed and set there. And nobody used to know where it was before that, you know, but now, now if you say Barry, they're, oh, Gavin and Stacey, you know. So. <laughs> But um, yeah, you were asking me um, just earlier about my name, okay? So maybe I'll just say a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, about your name. Yeah, where, wh why you changed your name, and also I think also what's really powerful for people to hear is the 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 moment in your life when you had that kind of you know whatever we want to call it awakening experience. Okay. Well, if I my head's full of stuff, okay? So if I ramble off a bit, just bring me back, you know, onto the path, like, okay? So so just on the name, um, yeah, most, most native English speakers call me Litmus, and most non-English native speakers call me Freeman, because when they say, oh, what's your name? And I say Litmus, say Freeman, the non-native English speakers tend to say lit, litmus, lit, litmus, what is litmus, you know? And if you try to explain that, it's a, and they say, if you say free man, hombre libre, hombre libre, you know, whatever. Um, ah, free man, okay, I get that, you know. So, um, but the litmus thing, that's, do you remember a movie called uh, Dead Poets Society? Yeah, I do. I also just, uh, I don't want to interrupt you while you're talking, but I also remember Gavin and Stacey. Okay, good. <laughs> right, and Uncle Bryn and all that, right. Okay, so, um, but the reason I mentioned Dead Poets is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm a big fan of movies and stuff because I find there's a lot of, there's a lot of good messages hidden in mainstream, you know, wrapped up in allegory, like, like, Greek mythology, you know, the, our modern equivalent of that is kind of movies and stuff, right? So you find a lot of allegory and clues 
to freedom and things in a lot of movies. And, you know, Dead Poets was back in 89, 1989, Gregorian, I think. Um, but, you know, if you've seen that, it's very much about the system trying to impose its dogma and tradition and rules on these kids and brainwash them into being this way, you know, and, and this teacher's just trying to liberate them and get them to be creative and express themselves, you know, really freely. So there was a guy in that movie and he decided, I think he went off to a cave one night and decided he wanted to be called No Wonder, you know. And he said, from now on, I, I want you to call me No Wonder, you know, because, and I thought, yeah, how, how cool is it to just have one name, you know, instead of like three names or two names or whatever. So um, at that point, I was thinking, oh, you know, I wonder if I could have a, a one word name, you know. So um, years later, a, a good friend of mine, um, came up with this nickname Litmus because my birth initials of my uh, my legal person, you know, registered, certified with a birth certificate corporation in the matrix name. Um, the initials, my birth initials are PH. So, you know, as people who speak English know, you know, PH is, a, is the percentage hydrogen scale on the the scale of acid and alkali and 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 to test the acidity or alkali you use a litmus paper and it goes pink or blue you know depending what the substance is so from ph you got, you got litmus and i really like that you know and it kind of stuck and and my kids friends and everything used to call me litmus and stuff so yeah i've been litmus for years now um and then the A free man thing came a bit later when, when I started my project. So I think the other, that gives you a bit of background, but I think the other thing you wanted to know was like, when was the, the moment, the awakening moment, you know, the, the revelation? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we talked about this before we started the recording a little bit. And uh, I just I just wanted to add as well, like my name, Robito, also has a, a, a meaning for me. It was in um, Granada in the south of Spain. It was the moment when I first experienced about 20 years ago of people just living in the present moment and not worrying about the, the past or the future and just playing music and uh, making, uh, you know, uh, artisan bracelets and things like this. And people living relatively free, you know, or at least living a free lifestyle. So that's yeah. where my name came from. And it stuck with me as well. Actually, with Litmus as well, did you experience there's a point in your life where suddenly, instead of like using it just with certain groups or people, it actually becomes your name. So like for me now, if I work at the university, I am Robito. Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought with the old thing, it was probably come some kind of Spanish thing for you. But yeah. yeah, and when you said libre, libre hombre, uh, uh, hombre libre. Hombre um, libre, yeah. For me as well, it's like Robertito, pero más pequeño. Like, uh, and then, ah, yeah, Robito, okay, yeah, and people laugh. Anyway, yeah, no, the awakening, like, so we talked before about, for me, it was 9-11. Um, of course, you realize you've always been on the journey and you realize that you'd already kind of sussed it out earlier, but there's a point in our lives where suddenly it clicks. And for me, it was 9-11. I won't go more into detail about why that was now for uh, because of the time for the interview. But, but when, when was it for you? What was that moment where it was like, it just clicked that, oh yeah, this is all just this network of manipulation? Yeah, well, um, September the 11th, uh, 2001, um, it was part of the journey for sure. I try not to use 9-11 because that I found that to be a mantra, a kind of evil mantra, you know, and all of these things have frequency and vibration. And, and, and as you know, 9-11 is an American way of saying a date, you know. But also if you, if you take 9-11, if you divide 9 by 11 and look at the numbers you get, the numerology of that is very interesting. So that's another story, but... Um, but yeah, September 11th was definitely part of it. But yeah, for me, I've always felt uh, kind of like a bit of an alien, you know, like I'm not really here, like my essence is somewhere else. And I've always felt like I'm just like viewing this world that I'm in through these eyes 
And it, and it is like an avatar, you know. When I saw the movie Avatar, I was like, well, that's how it kind of feels, you know. I used to hear people saying, you know, about like talking about life and the world and stuff. And it always, I just never seemed to resonate with a lot of what they were saying, you know. I always felt a bit different. But when you're younger, you don't always say, you know, because you don't want to stick your head above the parapet, like kind of thing. Um and we get kind of conditioned, part of our core conditioning, you know, is to kind of fit in and just be the same as everyone else and be, you know, and then, you know, in a, in modern society, it's like, it's like, I've got to be cool and down with the cool kids and all that. So, so yeah, I've always felt like the world wasn't really like it was, we were told it was, you know. And I guess the time when that really started coming out was in the mid 90s, Gregorian for me. Part of that was was reading a book called The Celestine Prophecy. Yeah. I don't I know if you're it. aware of that book. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, at that time, I was working in the, in the corporate world, in the energy industry. But I was really, really feeling, you know, that wasn't really me. And I was like, it was like I was an actor, you know, playing a role. And I was quite good. I, I, I was quite successful in that world. But, you know, it's this very hierarchical corporate structure kind of thing and dog eat dog and everyone trying to get promotion and all of that stuff, you know. And I, I just really, that just wasn't my true nature, you know. I'm very much um, about equality, you know, and, and I'm into like the true meaning of anarchy as Mark Passio Will, will has gone to great lengths to share with us all, you know, the true meaning of anarchy is no rulers, not no rules, right? So, you know, we're all equal and no one's, you know, you're, I'm not the boss of you and you're not the boss of me, you know. And I've got a song about that, by the way. You know, what I found in my life is, is don't pay too much attention to the, who the messenger is or the way they deliver their message, but just focus on the message, you know. Because you will get some really amazing messages from the weirdest places, you know. And if you're kind of prejudiced about where or who you listen to or whatever because of some conditioning or something, you might miss the little golden nugget, you know, uh, the the gem that's in what they're saying. So, um, yeah, I find I found that book wasn't the best book written, but. The, what the content of it was really good and it and it just really you know you know what it's like when you read a book or you see a movie or whatever you get it's like wow I really get that you know or you hear a song you know you just really relate and you kind of connect with the people who created that thing yeah and you get you get what they're trying to say to you you know and that's what I tried to do in, in my music as well so I really got the the message of that book and it talked a lot about um, it talked a lot about the, the kind of dra control dramas that people use to get energy from each other, like energy vampires, rather than tapping into the source and just getting energy from the universe, you know. So um, that was a really good message. And also it, it talked a lot about um, being open to so-called coincidences. You know, because what they really are, 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 are like signposts on the way for you, you know. So, and, you know, and if you meet someone who seems familiar to you, they've probably got a message for you. So you should probably go and interact with them, you know. So I just kind of started doing that and it totally just worked, you know. Um, and a lot of things started opening up. I mean, that's, that's something I particularly remember being in a corporate environment. And I actually, you know, I started, you know, not wearing a tie. <laughs> like I did that in school. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. We, we all probably did that at some point in school. But, you know, I was in this corporate environment. Everyone's in suits and, and ties and everything. And, you know, that you, you can imagine. Um, so my little first act of rebellion was to not wear a tie. You know, and then people say, oh, why isn't he wearing a tie? What's, what's the matter with you? You know, what's he doing? And my boss had say to me, um, oh, I've noticed you're not wearing a tie today. You know, what, what's going on? Like, <laughs> you know, but it wasn't long after that that we 
our American owners started this dress down Friday thing, you know, and, and then everyone on a Friday would wear jeans and shirts and stuff and no ties, you know. Um, and then sometimes I was, I'd have a, a meeting with a customer. So I put a suit on. It's about, it's about just expressing yourself, but also addressing, dressing appropriately in that situation, right? You know, for the circumstances, not just doing what everyone else is doing or doing what they say you got to do, you know, it's use your own, use your own savvy, you know, to, to do what you, what you think's right, you know. A lot of what you say resonates with my own experience as well. I also grew up never feeling like anything out there really made sense. And, um, but uh, be- because of time, I want to keep this about you. Um, I watched the interview you t- that's on your website. Uh, I believe the Project Freeman website because you've got a co- you've got one or two different ones there websites and um, a lot of websites actually yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was t- uh, so I watched it. It was ten years ago, and in that video, you were talking about the uh, freeing yourself from the system, and you talked specifically about Iraq and uh, Afghanistan and uh, how you didn't want to support the war and things like that. So perhaps now might be a good time to describe, you know, for the viewers, what, what does it mean for you? And also you just mentioned that when you were at work, you sometimes wore a suit. And in that interview, you were talking about how it's important to, to kind of step between, or maybe you were talking about that with me more recently, but, um, but, but you certainly mentioned that, you know, it's important to also be and not spend all your time researching all this stuff. So what, what does it mean for you? Because there's a lot of stuff out there now, whereas you did this 10 years ago, but there's a lot of stuff out there now about common law, stepping out of the system in the UK and in the USA, and probably many other, actually in Czech Republic also, there's a big movement towards that now where I am. So what does it mean for you to be free? And uh, what, what, what were the steps that you took in order to achieve that? Yeah, the thing about being a free man, is it, it is, you know, you have to, you want to be free, right? So um, whatever you get into, you don't want to just get bogged down spending all your time doing that and find that you're not actually free, right? It was about getting physically free to have time to do other things. And I call that time to be, you know. So if you, yeah, if you look at projectfreeman.com, you'll see it's split into... Uh, three sections which is um free the body free the mind free the spirit you know so what i this whole you you're right about what you said you know the the stuff coming back you know i i did i got into i set a project freeman in 2008 gregorian um so that's like 15 years ago now right yeah but but you'll find these things do do come round again, um, like flat Earth is coming back a bit now, right? And one of the good things about COVID was it got rid of bloody flat Earth. <laughs> you know? So um, it's, there's a lot to unpack. The thing with the Freeman stuff, some of that I believe now was a bit of a psyop. So I, I think part of the part of the Freeman on the land stuff. Um, was probably put out there by somebody in the in the in they you know from they the the hierarchy enslaving you uh, um, to because what what it what it did probably for those guys was it brought people out of the woodwork who who feel the way that, that we do you know and the thing with these with those other guys they they like to have everyone on databases and like registered in places and you know, surveilled and, and, you know, they like to, they like to know what the mood, what the mood is like, how, how successful is their brainwashing working, you know? Um, okay. Let's, let's put out this free man stuff and see who jumps on the bandwagon, right? Cause it, the ones who jump on the bandwagon, they'll, they'll probably be the type who are a bit more radical or a bit more uh, challenging to what we want to do, you know, and we need to, 
if we're going to try and impose more rules and control, you know, how much resistance are we going to have? Here's a way of testing it, okay? So um, if you do look at the free man on the land stuff, just be careful you don't get bogged down in some of it because, um, you know, some of it isn't true. And like most things, they mix some truth with some non-truth to create confusion, which can lead to apathy, but also it means, you know, it, it can lead to ridicule of some of the ideas if you mix truth with, with mis untruth. So I don't buy the whole free man on the land concept in total, but if you look at projectfreeman.com part one, free the body, basically that's a whole breakdown of that uh, hypothesis. So I go through the whole free man hy hypothesis and take it bit by bit, you know, and you can go and grab a, a cup of tea and you can go through it and look at the slides and, and see what I'm saying there. But a, a lot of it did check out, but some of it didn't. And what I found was people who went the whole hog, like you, you've introduced me saying I stepped out of the system. Yeah, I, I did in a lot of ways, but I didn't entirely do that because of what I found from doing the project was that isn't a good thing to do. Because if you want to be free, you want to be free. Part of being free is being free to move around. And if you completely take yourself completely out of the system, you won't be able to get a passport. And then you're not free because you can't leave. You know, if you're on the island, the, um, the island of Great Britain, for example, which those guys call the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is a corporation. So, you know, I, I, again, I try not to use the term UK. If you use the term UK, just know what it means. It's a, it's a corporate entity with a jurisdiction claimed by the crown, yeah, which is a royal dynasty going back thousands of years. Uh, Germanic dynasty um, but the island of Great Britain is is a is a piece of land you know a country a, a piece of countryside so it's a different thing um, but if you yeah if you're on that island and you you take yourself completely out of the the system or this is what I found back in 2008 2009 you know you wouldn't be able to get a passport I was I looked at things like they used to have a thing called a C letter. So years ago before um, passports and things were introduced, you know, because because years ago, common normal people were, were able to travel because they didn't have enough resources to do it. And only rich people ever went abroad, you know, because they could pay for journeys on ships and things like that. And if they were going to, a, if those wealthy people were going to a foreign country, they'd have a thing called a C letter, you know, and it would say, it would give them a permission from the embassy to kind of be in that, in that other, um, usually another royal family's claimed territory, right? <laughs> so, yeah, um, my, my point is that if you, if you take yourself completely out of everything, you kind of cut your nose off to spite your face, right? So what I did was I just, I just withdrew myself from the areas that I that I didn't agree with. Yeah, but I but I still maintained uh, a presence there to use sometimes when it benefited me and other people. So um, as you said, the Iraq War. You know, we, we talked about the things that wake us up. And yeah, the Celestine prophecy was part of that. But so were things like the murder of Princess Diana, uh, September the 11th. These are things where you just look at it and you go, hang on a minute, there's something stinking here. It just, I just don't buy this, you know? So yeah, you, you, you start to look at all those things and then you, you realize that the truth is very different to what, you know, BBC are telling you. Um, so you kind of have to be, you kind of have to be clear um, 
did did you want it you wanted to come in there did yeah you? i was just wondering because you know now there's a lot of people uh discussing um common law and uh stepping out of you know the system i totally agree with you that you know you can use the the, the tools that are out there from the you know the current system the matrix to your own benefit um yeah if if somebody's thinking about uh becoming free would you say that it should should you said there's three sections on your website should it begin with what you said like freeing up your time or should you be doing all three at the same time so also looking at stepping out of the the legal system uh not having to pay perhaps uh, income tax or i'm just wondering if people might be a little bit misguided from your from your 10 years of experience or if they might be approaching it in the wrong way or whether they're approaching it in the right way when they go straight to to common law and looking at how to step out of the legal system okay that's a really good point and the bit about is it this part then that part or is it a bit of everything it is it is kind of a a lemnis gate you know it's it's free the body to free the mind to free the spirit to free the mind to free the body you know but yeah i mean i think the thing is not to really listen to your own inner guidance you know really listen to your own inner intu intuition uh me little voice inside i call him melvin um that's my intuition which sits kind of here and whispers in my ear you know and gives me guidance when i listen to that voice it, it always works out very well for me and when i listen to the other guy the ego over here who's called gregory for me um it goes wrong you know so the thing with the free man stuff yeah you you know people would were, were jumping on this bandwagon and doing everything they were told to do to be a free man on the land and if you want to be a proper free man on the land you know, you have to send back your birth certificate and you have to send an affidavit to the queen and you have to deregister everything. And you have to give up all, everything in the system, you know, and, and people who did that went, to, some of them went to jail. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, I don't want to go to jail. That's not being free, is it? You know, so, so let's just, and the reason I did it, as you, as you said about the Iraq war and stuff. So you know, I didn't, I didn't do free man on the land stuff because I wanted to be a free man on the land and do everything that the free man on the land club said you had to do to be in that club, you know. Um, but, I, but I did love the idea of the free man because that's been around for thousands of years, you know. Um, so I, yeah, I, I did it because of, I was going on a lot of protest matches and things in London um, before I did free man stuff, I I quit my job. I I'd, I'd started a band. I I started being a, my real self instead of playing the acting the role in the corporate world. And you know, me and my band and friends, we were doing like peace festivals and trying to raise money for CND and stop the war and all these kind of things. And you know, we there'd be, yeah, as you probably know, thousands or even millions of people out on the streets marching and protesting, and they, they don't take a blind bit of notice. And it, you know, what I, what I realized was actually they like protesting because they can pretend, hey guys, look, you live in a free country. You have the right to protest. Oh, thank you. We're so grateful for having the right to protest. <laughs> you know, we don't, be, we don't need to be given the right to protest by someone else. We inherently have those rights that we're born with. So the good thing about researching free man stuff is it really does give you a great understanding of how the system works so that you can choose where and when and how you interact with that. And the main reason I did it was, was to stop paying tax for war. So, so what I found, you know, I was going on all these marches, nothing changed, 2 million people, marching in London, 2003, Gregorian, to stop, you know, don't, don't attack Iraq, you know, don't, you know, that was all tied into September the 11th from the US, right? And they were using that as an excuse to, to just go and murder people, you know, 
And what you find is, um, you know, all wars are paid for by taxes, right? So if you if you pay in tax, you're you're complicit in murder and genocide, right? So on one of the marches in London, I came across a flyer from um, from a it was from a a legal guy called Chris Coverdale. And it was, uh, he set up this thing, which was basically about the best way to protest is to, is to stop paying tax. And you can see a lot of this on, on part one of Project Free Man, uh, Free the Body. So what he was basically saying was, you know, if, if you want to remain law abiding and, and, and ethical and, and you don't want to be complicit in war crimes and murder, stop paying tax because tax pays for all of that stuff. And that really, that's the thing that resonated with me. Um, and that's why I looked at free man stuff as a possible way of protesting and in a non-violent, non-aggressive, peaceful way, you know, but withdrawing the funds which pay for this action, right? You know, and I, I wrote, I wrote a song called Free Man, and I also wrote a song at the same time called No Tax for War. And both of which, you know, just I've just released recordings of recently. But that No Tax for War, you know, that's that's the thing. What you what you realize is when you look when you look at how the system works, you know, the system's all based on debt. The whole thing's based on debt. 98.5% of all the so-called money in circulation is bank debt, which is created out of thin air by contracts. And, they, and all that money, so-called money, has interest on it. So, you know, they, these guys love the bankers and everyone like that, the banksters, as we call them, you know. They love war because war, as well as creating lots of fear and division, and arguments and separation and divide and conquer stuff, it also generates a lot of money, which is all debt. So, you know, what governments do with debt is they package it up into like things called bonds and gilts, you know, and then they sell it to investors who buy the debt and then the investors who buy the debt get the interest to pay by taxes from normal people. So it's a way of taking money from average working normal people and giving it to really rich, wealthy people who are investors, right? <laughs> and this, this is facilitated through the government tax system, you know, and, and most people don't realize this, you know, at all. Um, but I researched all of that, you know, and I wrote, I wrote to the Her Majesty's Treasury, um, under the Freedom of Information Act. And I found, I got them eventually to tell me exactly how much tax I paid in my life and how much national insurance on all of these things, you know, and I worked out what that was. And, and that was worth a minimum of like almost three quarters of a million pounds. And that was just from me working, you know, for 24 years in the system. Um, you know, and, and I asked him, how, do you, how is that money used? You know, how do you apportion taxes? And, and all these letters are on the website, on the archive on Project Free Man. But, but basically they said all, all taxes are paid into what's called the consolidated fund and will be distributed by the government as they see fit. Okay. But I wanted to stop paying tax for war. So I was like, well, I want to, you know, I knew at the time, back then, the, the government was spending like 50 billion, about 50 billion a year on the so-called defense. And this is the classic 1984 doublespeak, you know, they call it defense, which is actually going abroad and attacking people, you know. <laughs> so they were spending like 50 billion on, on war and 50 billion just on the interest on the national debt that all went to private banks. So 100 billion a year on war and debt. And that was the same as like they spend on the NHS, you know. So 
they tell you they haven't got money for things, but they've always got money for war and debt. Okay. Yeah. They've so always I, got. Mm. Yeah. So I wanted, I said, look, I, I want to start paying more for um, tax for war. And because it all went into one pot, and then they took the money for the war out of that, the only way I could be sure to not pay tax for war was to stop paying as many taxes as possible. So then I used the free man sort of uh, hypothesis, the techniques about common law and, and how the system works. I used that to send notices to, get to government departments uh, to give them notice that I was going to stop paying tax. And why, you know? And, and I had letters back from these people, and that's, I mean, that's a whole... But the main point is, for four years, I, I stopped paying all, all of those taxes. The only ones that you can't really stop paying are things like VAT uh, on goods, sometimes, and like, like duties. So if you, you know, if you buy a pint of beer, there's a duty on that, every pint of beer. Sold in a pub, and the reason it's called a pub is it's, it's a public house and public in law means royal okay so if you go to a pub the, the crown will tax all the all the produce from that public house and the money goes to the crown so you, it's hard to stop paying those kind of taxes but you can brew your own beer at home right and that's yeah. one way of doing it yeah <laughs> So basically, I, I, I sent notices and stopped paying as many taxes as I could. Yeah. I think we'll have to do uh, uh, further interviews because everything that you're talking about is, is really fascinating. And I, I feel like I'm talking to a, a soul brother right now because uh, I've Me been too, man. so many of the similar uh, things. Uh, but two, two things I want to just mention that you brought up. First one is I'm very passionate about following your intuition and not your ego. So that's a big one. If you want to, I say to everybody, if you can learn to train yourself to follow your intuition, you'll be kept safe. It's, Absolutely. it's, it's a simple way to survive whatever's going to come uh, moving forward. Okay. Um, the other thing is you said that you stopped paying tax for four years. Does that mean that it's not? Can you make it a permanent thing or, um, or, or do you have to keep applying for it every single year? The reason I say four years is because after four years, um, I couldn't do the income tax one anymore because I started getting some income that was taxed at source. Okay. And if like anyone who works for an employer will know, you know, you, they take the tax before they give you your money, right? And, you know, the interesting thing about employment is if you look, you know, the thing with the, the whole free man thing is, is, is very important to understand the terms used. So you, you might want to get one of these. You can see I've read a lot. I've read, did a lot of study of this. This is a, a law dictionary. So that, that's to... That's like having a French to English dictionary it, that translates from French to English. This one translates from English to legalese, which appears to be written in English, but isn't. And a lot of the words mean different things. It's really important to do your own research and really understand what you're doing before you take action. You know, don't, don't just download templates from people's sites and, and just sign them and send, send them, them off. off. Yeah, without realizing what you're doing, because you really have to know how this stuff works properly and you have to have a bit of experience, you know. Um, so I, I sent notices with real life situations to get experiences, starting with things like parking tickets and stuff like that. But so I did a parking ticket. <laughs> OK, yeah. How did that go? Yeah, it worked. I had to, I had to, there was uh, two, two, two replies that I had to pay it or they were going to, you know, take it to court or something. And uh, I went online, it took a, a bit of research just to do the parking ticket, but I, I looked it up. I found out all the right terminology. And then in the end, they, they let me off. It was like a 75 pounds parking ticket that I refused to pay because the, the pay machine where the car was, wasn't working. 
So how was I supposed to pay it? You know? Right. Right. Um, yeah. So, well, you know, the thing with parking tickets, as you probably found their offers to contract. Yeah. So yeah. it's an offer to make a contract and you, you don't have to just accept their offer. You know, you can, you can make a conditional acceptance or you can make an alternative offer. You know, <laughs> it's a negotiation, right? That's what I did. Actually. I, I made an alternative offer. I sent them, uh, I sent them the two pounds or something that it would have actually cost me to park there. And then they sent that back to me and said that the, uh, that, that it, that the, uh, you know, that it had been, the fine had been canceled. So yeah, um, yeah. that, that was my one experience so far of kind of doing that, that fighting the, the system. Yeah. So, you know, parking tickets is like a little one you can practice on. Um, I did that. I, so I practiced but to come back to your, your point about why was it four years, you know, and the income tax and stuff, um, where I was going with that was just to say, um, you know, that I, I, I stopped paying all the taxes I could by sending notices. So, you know, like to DVLA, um, which is featured in my No Tax for War song, um, and the HMRC and all, basically whichever department was responsible for that tax. I would send them a notice saying, and I was why why I was doing it was was to not pay tax for war, so not to be complicit in war crimes. Um, but I started to get onto what employment means. The reason I showed the dictionary is it's important to understand the terms. So we, even if you just look in an English dictionary at the at the word employment or employ, you'll find one of the definitions is to be kept busy and occupied to keep busy and occupied. So when they're employing you, they're keeping you occupied and busy, right? So you haven't got time to do anything else, right? <laughs> if, you are, if you're employed by someone else, there's, there's a few things with that. One, one is that, you know, they, they pay you gross, but then the, the tax man, the majesty's, uh, or his majesty now, isn't it? But HM, basically the crown, you know, the crown come in and say, right, we'll have our bit of that because we claimed all the territory of these islands of Great Britain, you know, and we 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 take tax on everything because we it's like we claimed it and no one's disputed our claim. So we're going to carry on doing that. You know? But with income tax, when I when I did my notice, I was self-employed. So if you're self-employed, you've already made the first step um, rather than, you know, uh, an employer paying me uh, and then the, the crown taking tax out of that before I got my money, my net, my, my net income, I was generating my income. And, uh, and you, as you probably know, if you're self-employed, you, you put a tax return in to tell them how much you've earned and how much, and you know, and they do assessment and they say, right, your tax is this or whatever. So at least if you're self-employed, you're keeping yourself busy and occupied, right? Right as much as you choose to, rather than someone else keeping you busy and occupied. Because when you're busy and occupied, you haven't got time to do research into how you're getting screwed over by the system every day. Right? <laughs> so the last thing these guys who run all of this want you to know is like how it all works and how you're getting screwed and how all your taxes are being sent off to pay, you know, pay for arms and to kill people and, and to give money to private investors who are buying debt and all of that kind of stuff, you know. But at least if you're self-employed, I then chose not to put my tax returns in. But I but I wrote to them with a notice telling them why I wasn't doing it because of the tax for war thing. Yeah. Um, and what was the what was the response when you send those notices off and you say, look, I'm not paying this because I've found out that this is all going into a pot. And this pot is being shared out and I don't know how much of it's going to war. You explain it all with reasoning and the correct terminology. Um, is that then just accepted or do you have to go through a whole kind of loops and things like this to, to actually get the final result? It depends on the particular tax and the, the people involved. Um, so they were all slightly different. But the, the, the point there is, is you don't, you're not refusing to pay it. What you're basically telling them is if they, can, if they can prove to you that you have to pay it and they can, they can assure you that if you do pay it, none of that money will be used to kill people, then you'll pay it. So that's like a, an offer, right? 
If you can prove these things to me in my notice, I'll pay it. But if you can't, I'm choosing not to pay it because I don't want to be complicit in genocide and murder. So that's what I did. And um, basically, the gist of what they write back to you to say is that, you know, all UK corporation citizens, uh, employees of the corporation, <laughs> must, must abide by statutory law. Well, you know, statutes are like rules of a club. If you, if you join a golf club, you'll find they'll have some statutes on their books, what their members, how, how they have to dress and how much subs they have to pay a year and this kind of thing. And it's the same kind of thing, you know. So um, they, out, they outline those rules that you're meant to comply with. But you have a choice. You have to consent to those rules, right? And if, if you don't consent to those rules, you kind of don't pay your subscriptions. You're not and part of the club up, anymore. You're not part of the club, right? Exactly. So I don't want to be a part of the genocide and murder club, right? <laughs> so, so I would, I don't want to abide by those statutes. So, and this is a good, this is a good example of where, if you go the whole hog and withdraw completely from the system, you kind of, uh, you kind of make things more difficult for yourself. You know, if you say I'm not going to abide by any statutes, then you can't use the statutes which are actually to the benefit of people, right? So there is a statute called the International Criminal Court Act. I think it's 2001. And in Article 51 and 52 in that act, it, it describes what genocide is. And it talks about complicit, complicity in genocide. So if you read that, and that's all on the website, projectfreeman.com, if you read that stuff, you'll see, you know, that, you know, if, um, if I'm going to go out and shoot someone and I have a gun and I say, Rubito, I haven't got any bullets, man. I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and kill someone in Iraq, right? But I need some bullets. And will you give me the money for the bullets? Yeah, okay, man, you know, I'll give you some money. So you give me the money for the bullets, I go buy the bullets, I go and murder someone. You're complicit in that crime, right? Because you've given me the money to buy the bullets. So all UK, UK taxpayers are complicit because they pay the taxes that buy the weapons that kill the people abroad. And in this International Criminal Court Act 2001, it says if you do that, you're complicit in genocide and murder. But I didn't, I, to me, that was a higher ethical position than a statute that says you have to pay tax. Because paying tax is just a financial transaction, which is a civil kind of issue. It does, it's not, it, there's no crime involved. It doesn't harm anyone. Um, but if you pay tax that you know is going to kill people, that's, that's criminal. So in, you know, when they wrote back to me and said, all UK citizens must comply with statutory law. You said, I said well, I want to comply with this statute. Yeah, I said, I said look, I, you haven't answered the points I raised in my first letter to you. Which they never do. <laughs> which they never do. They try and get you off onto another track, right? And, and I said, if you're saying that we, are, we have to abide by statutory law, I choose to abide by this statute that says... I mustn't be complicit in war crimes and, and genocide rather than this other statute that you say says I have to pay tax. And actually, if you actually read any of these things, you know, if you read two or three hundred pages of a statute, you'll see that in most cases, nowhere does it actually say that it's compulsory for you to do any of those things. But nobody ever reads these things, right? Because they're written in legalese, they're really long and dull, and most people don't understand them, and they get really bored, and they go and watch the football instead, you know? So they rely on that when they write these things so that most people will be in ignorance of what they're actually signing up to. You know, most of us go and register all our vehicles and, and you know, pay road tax and all these things without realizing that, that nowhere does it actually say we have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> I'd like to just, again, before we, <laughs> before we move on to the, the calendar and the music, one last question. 
you describe free man. So I just want to bring this up purely for the women watching this video. <laughs> is free man um, a term? Is it because you're a man? Is there a free woman? Why free man? So yeah, it's free man or woman, but rather than say free man or woman, you know, you, it's just free man. The or first, free, free person. Yeah, like, yeah, uh, but see, person, the thing with person, if you look in here, you'll, and it's on the website, you'll, you know, this is like free man 101 uh, person. A person, there's many types of person. The term person um, in that book refers to a natural person, which they say is a human being, or a legal or artificial person which is a corporation, okay? So you don't want to use the term person because it could mean a corporation. So I don't want to be a free person. Um, yeah, I want to be a free human or a free being. You know, free being might be nice, but free man doesn't, it's not about sex or gender at all. It's just a, a collective term for freeness, for being free. Yeah, that explains perfectly. Yeah. African-American slaves freed in America, I believe, were would call themselves free men. Yeah, it explains perfectly that, um, you know, the person is is not the right word. So therefore, you know, it's free man, free woman, or free human, free being. Yeah. And, and anyone can be a free man, whether you're man, woman, or use another term, I guess, if that resonates more with you, but not using person. Yes. And, you know, to be a free man or a free woman or whatever you want to call it, you got to be as free as you can be, right? It's pretty so, much impossible where we where we are in the current cycle of the of, of the universe and the system we live in, which comes onto the calendar. Um, it's pretty much impossible to be completely free of everything, you know. Um, but the thing is to just to be as free as what feels free, like being free to you, you know. If you feel free doing fifty percent of this or eighty percent or whatever it is. That's cool, you know, and, and for where you are now on, on, in your moment, on your journey, you know, because you, you, you can't jump from here straight to the end, you know, because you'll go nuts and, and you'll cause yourselves a lot of problems. You have to kind of take it step by step, you know, and be as, be as free as you can at every moment, you know. So moving on to the calendar... Uh, why is it so important for you to not use the Gregorian calendar? And is the calendar that you're now using your own creation? I believe the answer to that is yes. And uh, how did, you know, it's about the calendar, really. Okay, well, the, the calendar came out of Project Freeman. So having, having done all the legal Freeman part one, free the body stuff, um, that gave me time to be. Um, and once once you're not employed and you have time, basically you can open your mind to the universe. Um, you know, and, and on that by that stage, I'd got a camper van and I was living on the road um, a lot in the mountains in France and places like this and playing music and, and sleeping under the stars and not really... It didn't matter what day it was, you know. There was no, there was no weekend weekday thing really. Um, and when you're when you're when your mind is free, and it's not cluttered by all these obligations of the, the system, you know, I, I would wake up each morning. I call it morning musings, and I, you know, and I call the universe the guys. You know, it, some people call it angels or whatever it is, but you know, or God or whatever it means to you. But I say just like, hey, guys, what do you want to tell me today? You know, and uh, you start to get messages. You start to kind of download stuff from the, the collective consciousness, right? So um, one of the messages I got was, was that, you know, time and like clocks and calendars, these are, these are part of what I now call uh, core conditioning. So these are things which are put on us as very, very young, you know, children, you know, that we have to be at school at this time on the clock and we have to have lunch at this time and we have to be home at this time and 
we have to go to bed at this time and you know time 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 clock 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 you know it's like right from like very small children and the calendar is another one um you know we get told oh it's monday so you have to go to school today you know and but it's saturday so you don't have to go to school and you can stay in bed in the morning you know so you get conditioned into this artificial cycle which does not exist anywhere in nature okay and i'm particularly talking about the week so the week is an artificial man-made construct which does not have any natural cycle unlike the day and the month and the year and a thing called the great year which we can talk about those are all natural astronomical astrological cycles and nature follows those cycles but nowhere in that system of cycles in nature is there anything called a week of seven days and there's no such thing as a weekend and a weekday it's a completely artificial construct like the matrix which is made up by men okay to control people's behavior you know trees do not stop growing because it's sunday okay so you know the sun comes up in the morning and it sets in the evening and it keeps doing that and it doesn't matter whether if the gregorian calendar says it's wednesday or sunday or whatever you know it just does that and it does it based on seasonal cycles so i just started realizing that that a lot of my behavior through my life had been conditioned by the clock and the calendar so i started just opening to that you know to being free of that <laughs> cuz if you the way i see it is like kind of like an onion you know with lots of layers and if you're if you're employed in the matrix you know and you got a, a a house and a mortgage and two cars and the family and you're paying all the bills and you got all of that stuff you know you're you got lots and lots of layers on your onion okay <laughs> but you what you can do is start peeling those layers back yeah and at the center is freedom yeah and you have to try and peel as many layers back and the close the more layers you peel the closer to this this the core you get the more free you are yeah the first layer you might say right that's employment the first thing i have to do is stop being employed by other people and doing what they tell me right so let's get rid of that layer you know and you you so you get rid of that that layer and you go to self employment and you keep doing it you know and you end up you end up like i did selling your house and buying a camper van and a boat and you know not not have any any rent or mortgage because that's a, the big ones to get in free there's that's big layers of the onion right there because if you don't have those things to pay you you don't need so much income and then you're much freer to live the life you want because you can support yourself so the clock and the calendar they're they're way down in the layers you know but if you if you've peeled a lot of those layers off you get down to those kind of things so i got that's where i got to and i was i was on um, i was in my van on a cliff top in sagres in the south of portugal basically the southwest corner of europe and i was packed above, above a beach called moreta beach you know and i was living in my van i didn't have a clue what day it was um and i'd been kind of living near a beach with a guy who was a who was a wiccan uh, bowsman and he had a book about uh, druids and bards and ovates and how they used to look at the year and this kind of thing so this was all coming into me and i'm on this cliff top and i was there about 4 or 5 days and the first 3 days i opened my curtains and my van looked out at the beach you know and the beach was empty and it was a beautiful sunny day I mean you know what winter in the Algarve is like right it's like 18 degrees you know average temperature <laughs> so it's not really like winter for us northerners you know um 
So I'm thinking, look at this, and I'm lucky. How lucky am I? Look, I got this whole beach to myself pretty much, you know. <laughs> and I'd go for a walk on the beach and have a swim and nobody there, three days running. The fourth day, I opened my curtains. I'm like, wow, what's going on? It's like the beach is packed with people and the cafes are open and there's vans everywhere and there's surfers. And, and I'm like, what's going on, you know? And then I, so I found a, a calendar or something somewhere. And of course it was Saturday. And I thought, this this is ridiculous, you know? So then of course the next day was the same because it was Sunday uh, and it was busy again. And then of course Monday came and it was empty again. You know? <laughs> And it was like a it was like a light bulb moment, you know. It was like this this big like revelation thing. You know, I realized how you know what I imagined. All these people who'd just been on the beach for two days, when they go to the beach, they think everywhere is crowded because they're all going to the beach at the same time, right? And then and then I imagine all these people now they're all it's Monday, so they're all going to work, right? So, <laughs> So they're all getting in cars and driving to, into the cities and like commuting, you know, and, and going and being employed. And they and everywhere they go there, it's busy and there's loads of people. But the beach is empty, right? <laughs> and now I've got the beach to myself again. So I just thought this is crazy, you know. And I imagined all these people in the matrix. They all they think the the, the planet's overpopulated, you know, and it really is not. You know, if you fly over the, the planet, there is acres and acres and acres of empty space with nobody and nothing in it, right? But everywhere you go in the matrix, it appears to be busy. And what I realized was the calendar is basically the calendar of the matrix, right? So the re to answer your question, after all that rambling, <laughs> you know, why I don't use the Gregorian calendar as my main calendar is because it's the calendar of the matrix. If you research the calendar, you find it's the Roman Empire calendar and basically the Christian era calendar. So it's an empire and it's it's a colonial empire based uh, religious control mechanism. So that was the revelation. And then I thought there must be a better way, you know, there must be I mean, ultimately, when we're free, we don't need a calendar at all, okay? But while we're on the journey, we still kind of need some kind of framework where we know we're going to, when are we going to meet at the beach for Beto and Jam and have a, have a, you know, have a party or whatever? Yeah, or when are we going to do this interview? Yeah, when are we going to do the interview? So we're doing the interview on the 4th of Pisces, right, for me. So I, yeah, so I, I thought... There's, there's got to be a better way. One, the week, the week is a crazy thing, the week and the weekend thing. So I started looking at that in, in my journal. And, you know, I was living in my van. I had no internet. I, had, I didn't have a dongle or anything. I was offline completely, which is another big, I would recommend that to everyone. If you really want to open your mind to the cosmic messages, you know, get off grid, like disconnect digitally from everything. And then you, you haven't got all the wave waveforms uh, interfering and you can get all, a lot of good stuff yeah so I did that and I thought right I'm going to start looking at you know if I, I imagine if I was an alien coming to this planet it's like a scout you know and I had to send message back to my home planet and say you know how does time and stuff work on this planet earth right well what would I do what 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 cycles would I tell them about? You know, what, how do the seasons work? And so that's what I started doing. And I, I came up with a structure based on the sun and the moon and the earth and where we are in our system, where we live in the, in the universe. And if you do that, you find that if you have 12 months of 30 days, you get 360 days. And that's one for every degree of a circle. So is there a clue there about the relationship with degrees? But you have five days left over, you know. But if you look at how the seasons work, and of course nature follows the seasons, you realize there's four seasons, you know, and, and we, we call them spring, summer, autumn, and winter. 
So actually, if you have a day, a special day to celebrate each of those, there's four days, yeah? And then you got one left. So if you have like what I call New Year's Day to celebrate the start of a new nature cycle, you have New Year's Day and then a day for spring. And then you have three months of 30 days for spring. Yeah, and then you have a special day for summer, and then you have, and so on. You have a special day for autumn. Right. So you. It's really inspiring, up, actually, because you can celebrate the new season coming in, right? Exactly. You have a special day. So you have a day for New Year to celebrate a new cycle, and you have a day, day for spring equinox, day for summer solstice, day for autumn. Probably I'm I'm looking in reverse in my video, so <laughs> probably the other way, you know. So this we, we yeah, can this, see it the right way. So okay, okay. So you know, sp special day for New Year, special day for spring equinox, special day for summer solstice, special day for autumn equinox, special day for summer uh, winter solstice. So there's your five extra days, and then and then the months in green here. The you know these are the 12 months of 30 days, which gives you 360. So this is what I came up with. But but what I did was I split the 30-day the months into into 10-day sections called, called deacons. Because, you know, we have 10 here. Mm -hmm. So there's a clue there. It's really, really simple if you do things in 10s <laughs> rather than 7s. Um, and... I came up with this structure and then I went to Villa de Bishbo Internet uh, Cultural Center and got on the internet there on the computer and started researching calendars. And then I found it was crazy. You know, there's like 46 different calendars in use. And we all live on the same planet with the same cycles. <laughs> so why do we need 46 different calendars? And of course, you find most calendars are religion based. They're based on some profit. Or, or some deity that's worshipped by some group of people or whatever. Um, and they used to control people. Um, but if you look at the, the really ancient calendars, like the old um, Hebrew and uh, Hindi, like in India, the Indus Valley, and China, and re these, these cultures that are thousands of years old, you'll find lots of similarities um, about the structure of their time cycles. And they're all based on what I call astronomology, which is astronomy and astrology. What about, you know, a lot of people talk about the Mayan calendar. Was that based on cycles? Absolutely. I, I previously looked at the Mayan calendar like 20 years ago. Um, and that, that is interesting. One of their main calendars is called the Zolkin calendar, which is a 260 day cycle. Uh, which is made up of 20 like glyphs and 13 um, numbers. And you have a combination of days, you know, based on the 20 and the 13. So you have a 260 day cycle and that for the Mayans where they lived, um, that tied into cosmic cycles, but particularly in that case, the cycle of Venus You'll find the cycle of Venus through the zodiac is, a, is about that length. It's about the length of the gestation of a human, about nine months. And it's kind of how long the corn growing cycle, the maize growing cycle in that part of the world takes, you know, from planting and growing and harvesting and eating and all that. That's about 260 days. So, you know, there's reasons for the length, but they have another calendar called the Hab calendar, which is, a 360 day cycle. So there was a clue there. And then they have things like the long count, which ties into uh, grander cosmic cycles, which we can talk about, but that's a bit more detail. Okay. I did, I looked at Mayan, but Mayan is part of, of the answer. But what I wanted was a, a calendar that worked for everyone on the planet the same, regardless of where they were in the North or the South or the East or the West. So I was just looking at a global thing that, that's not biased to any one hemisphere or, or any one place, but it's, so I, it's now called the Universal Celestial 
calendar because it's universal. It's the same for everyone. It's based on the universe. And it's celestial because it's the movement of the celestial bodies, yeah. Maybe if you look at these really old calendars, that's what they all do. You'll find that they all follow pretty much the zodiac, you know. What I, what I realized was that the thing I came up with in numbers, which I thought was my own unique creation, you know, what, one of the... If you look at my calendar website, you'll see one of the things I found on the internet was an old Mexican calendar, which looks a hell of a lot like this, this bit in the middle. Hang, hang on a little sec. So just this bit, this, this is just the year bit. So you can see the special days more. But there's an old Mexican calendar online on Wikipedia that looked really like this. So I realized I didn't really, I didn't really create something new. I rediscovered something that was ancient. And how it then, often works, right? Is and that that's you, how it often works, yeah. I met, I was talking to, to um, Dirk Christoph yesterday in an interview about uh, net positivity and, and the, the idea that, you know, you can have permanent growth on a finite planet, which is a paradigm shift, if everything that you're doing has a more positive net impact on the world than a negative one. Um, and he was talking about how the ideas that the idea of net positivity was something which Harvard had already written about, but he didn't know about it until he'd actually come up with the idea himself. And I right. was talking to him how I've had similar experiences for me. Uh, I, I went deep into meditation because I had suicidal ideation growing up. That's what, um, I, I now live in the present moment. Like I don't worry about the future or the past. Exactly, and yeah. I say to people, it's just neuroplasticity. In fact, I was talking to my girlfriend yesterday about you have to put as much effort into focusing in, for bringing your attention into the present as you would do to learn a musical instrument, as you would do to become good at anything. And then That's your brain right. will cooperate and you'll stay there. And then I, I came to this realization that Meditation is something we need to be doing all the time, not just something you do for 20 minutes in the morning or whatever, uh, and just keep bringing your attention back. And I realized that I started it, I was doing it, and then I went to a Thai forest monk monastery and read uh, that I was presented with a text from the Buddha that said the same thing. And I was like, oh, okay, so this isn't new, you know? <laughs> so uh, many of these experiences, you know, we have these epiphanies, we have these, as we talked about before, coming from intuition, not from the ego. I also took pretty much five years of just stepping out of social media and digital world and things like that. And you get these, these inspirations, these downloads, synchronicities, coincidences. Yeah. And, um, and then you realize that it, as you say, you know, uh, collective consciousness, universal consciousness is all there. And, uh, and that nothing is probably really new. It's just accessing what's available in the, in the quantum field or whatever we want to call it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Totally. You know, this is probably why a lot of what you were doing through the scandemic, you know, this was like, I'm like, I'm with this guy, you know, I want to talk to this guy because, because you would, you were saying you were actually communicating on the internet, all the things that I was thinking and feeling inside, you know, and what and you've sure been talking to other people. Right. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, so everything you say now, everything you're talking, I mean, obviously I don't, I haven't taken the time to go into the, uh, le what was it, legalese or to create my own, my, uh, my own calendar. But everything that you're saying, uh, it's like, yeah, I'm resonating totally. We have to meet up in Portugal so we can actually have more of a two-way chat because while you're talking, you know, I want to leave you to just speak and say what, what you want to say yeah. once people have watched this interview we could mm -hmm. potentially do one for uh for, for step for, for the free man stuff also but we could do a zoom on the calendar i know you're super passionate about it and i think that the explanation you've just given of why it's important and how it's linked to the cycles and how these ancient calendars were all linked to the cycles means that many people would be really interested in learning more about it so we could do a Zoom, which we record perhaps, so we can share it after, but invite everybody from the CPN community and anyone else that wants to come and join in to do a deeper dive 
into that calendar. Um, sure. For now, great, for now, where can people find information? You said you've got a separate calendar website. I do. I mean, if you want to, if you want to get to all my websites, you can go to litmusafreeman.net. So that's like a home page where all the, they're all linked. Um, and on there, you'll see one a link to the Project Freeman and to the calendar and to my music and and everything. So that's a good like starting point. But particularly for the calendar, it's called the Universal Celestial Calendar. And it's also called the free man calendar. So if you want to minimize your typing, <laughs> the, the easiest, the shortest URL to type in is ucc.zone. And then if you, it'll tell you the structure of the calendar. There's some FAQs there about why, why do you even want to have, have a different calendar? You know, what's, what's wrong with the Gregorian calendar and what's, What's better about this one? You know, you can look at all that. And if you really want to get into it, there's a whole wiki page I did, which goes into all the, the, the maths and the, the formulas and the cycles and the detail, you know. If nothing else, it really helps people to know what cycles we're in, you know, like so we become more connected to nature and we become more aware of what nature's doing, which Absolutely. I think... Absolutely. Well, really what, our, what our ancient ancestors did was they gave us a thing called the Zodiac. And that, if you if you basically get in sync with the zodiac, you'll be in sync with nature. And if you if you get in sync with the zodiac, you can also then look at your own birth chart, and you can get in sync with your your own birth energies and how they flow with the cycles. And if you have a calendar like this, you can put all your astrology onto that calendar. Because that's basically an astrological calendar. So if anyone's into astrology, they're going to love this calendar because it's pretty much aligned with the tropical zodiac. Okay. And then wow. So we'll definitely do another session or something on this so that people can join and you can go deep purely into the calendar because it's that, fascinating. That'd be great, man. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, your music. So you said that you started uh, you when you quit your job, when you became free from, you know, the matrix in the sense that you, you, you know, uh, left the employment, become self-employed, started doing the music. So the practical side of taking your, giving yourself more time. Um, what is the music for you? What is the, you know, the music is uh, an expression of what's coming from within, within you, or do you have a particular message that you're trying to share through your music? Yeah, I guess music is my first love, you know, it's, <laughs> it's um, I'm just naturally musical. Um, I, I taught myself pretty quickly and relatively easily to, to play the guitar when I was about 16. And, and later I got into, I now think of myself, I, for, re, for me, it's really about creation, you know. It's, it's, so if you're into astrology, it's about your fifth house in your, in your birth chart. And in my chart, my fifth house is my biggest house. Okay, so that's all about creativity. So if you're lucky enough to have children, children I have two great lads and an adopted daughter and children are the... the I have to be careful now because I get emotional. <laughs> But um, children are the ultimate expression of creativity. Um, and that's my boys for me, you know. Um, after my boys, you know, my songs, they're like little babies as well, you know. So, you know, and, and when you detach like you did from all the digital stuff and, and all of that, you open yourself to, you become like a, a channel, you know, like a conduit. You tap into the... All, this, all the creative energy of the universe, you know. Um, so I, I love writing songs. Um, I love playing with words. I like doing poems and stuff. So my music, when I, when I put words to music, um, yeah, I love, you know, I'm a big Beatles fan, inspired by the Beatles. So I, I love the melody of McCartney but I love the message of Lenin, you know? So 
when I was younger, I tended to write more romantic songs, you know, girl boy stuff, like like early Beatles stuff. <laughs> if if anyone knows the Beatles, you know, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, you know, poppy kind of I love you, you love me kind of stuff. Oh, I'm so heartbroken and all that, you know. Um, but as I got older and, and as I was on this journey more and getting more free and stuff, you know, I really wanted to write about all, all of that stuff. Um, so really, I, 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 I think, right, you write a song, you've got like three to five minutes typically. Like, say something, you know, say something, you know, share a message with the world, you know, um, because even if it's only one other person or being, Sorry, shouldn't use person. <laughs> That's a Freudian free man slip. Yeah, if only one, one other being connects with that, that's great, you know. Someone else is already resonating with what you're saying. So I've, you'll see this on my, my music website, but yeah, I, I kind of moved from writing more about relating um, into what I call realization. So I have lots of songs about realization. You know, where you realize you're not free, but you want to be free. So I wrote a lot about that kind of stuff, about about religion and the system and, you know, all of that stuff. So lots of songs about that. And then I, I started writing more things like Free Man and No Tax for War, things we can do about it, you know. Because the important thing for me is, yeah, you can do all the research, you can read all the David Icke and you can... You can find out how shit everything is, <laughs> but at some point, and this is why I like what you, you're doing, you know, because you've got to focus on solutions, you know, you've got to focus on what are we going to do about it? It's, it's all, we can write all protest songs about, yeah, everything's shit and we're all getting fucked over, you know, <laughs> but, but like, I want to write something about what we can, how we can change it, you know. So then I write, started writing a lot more songs, what I call Remedy and Rebellion, you know which is like the positive thing. This is what we can do about it. And I have some songs, which I call Revelry, which are just for a laugh, you know, because humor is really important as well, you know. Um, one of my big inspirations was Bill Hicks, you know, and he would tell you how shit everything was, but he really make you laugh doing it, you know. <laughs> and it's really good to laugh at this stuff because it's fucking ridiculous, right? And it is hilarious. And it's like a Monty Python film we're living in, you know? So, so yeah, let's laugh at it and then leave it over there, stewing in the corner, and let's, let's get our guitars and go and have a jam and make some positive energy, you know? So that, that's what it's about for me. I see these people, you know, that however you want to describe, I don't, I don't like elites, I don't think they're elites at all, but, you know, these no. people behind the scenes that are trying to dominate and take over the whole world, as you know, it's hey, just laughable hey. joke, really. Like yeah. such, you know, what a pathetic way to decide to try and spend your life is to try and take control of everyone. And um, of course, there's a lot of horrors and things that are happening and have always happened. And they are ramping up right now. There's more that, you know, they're, they're really going for it at this point. But I mentioned before this interview though, that we're talking now in CPN a bit about these four phases that I, I, I describe as. The first one is the cognitive dissonance. You realize that the whole world's just not what you thought it was. The second one is you then start doing all the research. So that's when you start connecting all the dots and you go into a space of doom and gloom or, a you know, we're all stuffed and, uh, uh, or, you know, like you were saying with the Freeman stuff, you can get lost in just research, research. And then the, the, the next stage, I would say, is reclaiming. So reclaiming your health, reclaiming balance, reclaiming your freedom. And then the final stage is what are you going to do about it now? So, you know, what, what do you want to contribute? How do you want to share the message? So what it sounds like to me is that your music's been on a bit of that journey as well. Yeah. I mean, I like, I like the stages you're talking about there. And I guess we all have our own kind of similar take on that kind of thing. I have a thing called the five A's, which is very similar, but you know, it, it goes through awareness and anger and apathy and action, you know, and then anarchy. So yeah, you can, you can get bogged down, but it's what you do about it at the end that matters, you know? Um, 
to be free and equal with everyone else, all your fellow beings. You know? So yeah, the, the music is, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to express how I think the, you know, my basic passion is how does the universe work? And a lot, I, I feel a lot of my songs are kind of sharing my view of what I've learned about how the universe works. Um, so, for example, I've got a song called Lost Without Love. And it's a very nice kind of melodic ballad. But it's basically saying, you know, it's, it's all about love. The, the universe is made of love, you know, and we're all made of love. And when we, when we give out love and we resonate in the love, you know, love vibration, the, the collective consciousness raises, it elevates. And, and, you know, the year in my calendar is based on the cycle of human, the rise and fall of human consciousness. So that's something we can get into when we talk more about that. But when we, if we live in fear, everything goes down and we get trapped in the, in the root chakra and we get, we get bogged down in a dense, low vibration and everything grinds to a halt and feels miserable, you know. But when we open, when we get our hearts broken, and we open to love, everything goes up, you know. And then we tap into the 90% of the material of the universe that the scientists don't know what it is, you know. Well, it's it's love. <laughs> That's what it is, right? They call it dark energy and dark matter. It's not dark at all. They, they just don't know what it is because they're looking at the science, you know. But we need to look at the science and the spirituality you know, and then we have a sciential experience. So um, that's one of my little word plays. But um, it, this is what it's all about for me. Yeah, I saw that when you moved to go and get the other calendar. The aim of life is love. The purpose of life is love. The lesson of life is love. Or love is all you need. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I need to uh, start to wrap this up now, but um, <laughs> the final question I think is a really important one, which is, you know, what would you suggest, your journey, your knowledge, everything you've experienced, what you're expressing through your music, what, what advice would you give to people who are uh, in the first stages? You said you've got the five A's, so maybe not the action and the anarchy, but the first three the anger, you know, the, the fear, people that are um, not sure what steps to take, where to go, how to be free, how to express, you know, they're stuck. What would be your, your advice for people listening to this that feel like that? Number one, as much as possible, try and disconnect, uh, switch off, cut yourself free from all the negativity. Um, you know, have some digital detoxing, have days, have days at least where you don't even switch the phone on and you don't switch the computer on, you know, go in, look, at, I have another song called Look Inside. Have a listen to that song. That's my view. You know, when, when we, God is inside us all, you know, what they call God. When the we, guys. When we get, the guys, yeah, the guys, as I call it. You know, all the answers are all inside of us because we're um, a microcosm of the macrocosm. We can study hermeticism, you know, which tells us as above, so below. And this is a key to a lot of things. But, you know, when we're, when we're plugged into the matrix and all the internet and everything, we're, we're getting fed stuff from outside. But when we cut that off, and we connect with our inside and we go in, that's where we find all the answers. And that's where the intuition comes. And, and that's where we instinctively know what to do. And that's, that's when we open to the, the cosmic messages, you know, and where things start to get better. So I think, you know, people, I think we all, have a, we all have a mission and we're all here to do something. You know, we all have a... Uh, a purpose and a way we need to develop in each, in what I believe to be each incarnation, in, you know, of our soul, you know. Um, and he, I, I love 
the phrase, you know, even in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. I think that's a Gandhi quote, but I'm not sure, but it's a good one. So you, you know, you already have all the answers you need. You don't need anyone else to tell you anything. All you have to do is look inside. Just go inside. Yeah, reconnect with the source, you know, because that will guide you. When you look inside, you find the path and you, you find the guide and you can follow that path. And yes, you can be aware of what's going on out there, but don't let it distract you from your path, you know, because most of that stuff out there is about distraction, you know, and, and they, the hierarchy enslaving you, <laughs> um, they want to distract you from your mission. You know, because what they try and do is put the whole weight of the world on everyone's individual shoulders. And they say, oh, the war over there and all the mayhem and the disaster and the, you know, what are you doing about it? You, and we all feel guilty. And, and we can't, we, it's impossible for us all individually to bear all of that on our shoulders. What we've got to individually focus on is our mission. And if we all just individually fulfill our own unique mission, Everything will be fantastic. That's my message. That's a beautiful message. Thank you so much. Don't worry about the world. Just get, you know, get, get on your path, focus on your mission and try not to be distracted by the other things and live in, live in love and joy, you know, create, make music, write poetry, art, you know, paint. Um, dance and sing together, all that stuff, you know? Yeah. And when you connect to that, when you connect to that mission, uh, your personal mission, whatever that is for you, your calling, why you're here, it will be contributing to a better world. You know, that's Absolutely. what you were, that's what you were saying. If everybody did that, we'd be living in a, in a perfect world, an ideal world, a paradise, if we all did it, you know? Yeah. But you know, the good news is we're on a, we're in a thing called the great year, uh, I believe. This seems to be what's happening. Um, and it's a cycle of consciousness. And uh, again, on the, on, the, on the others, when we talk more about the calendar, we can look at that cycle. But briefly, you know, it's a cycle from the golden age of peak enlightenment and cosmic consciousness down to the Kali Yuga, you know, the, the age of ignorance. Um, and, you know, death and mayhem and torture and corruption and all this stuff. Um, and that was in the Gregorian calendar, that was 500 AD. And we're now kind of here, but we, we're going this way back. We're ascending back up to, uh, towards the golden age of cosmic enlightenment, you know. So it's understandable that, that there's only so many people awake right now, but, but we're ascending. So as... Every day, more and more people are going to wake up and remember and rediscover things from our ancient ancestors, like I did with the calendar. So, you know, so don't don't let them tell you that everything's shit and it's all going to be dystopian and we're all going to, you know, live in the control matrix and stuff, because that's that's not going to happen unless we manifest that, you know. And if all we do is give out the mantras that they're feeding us of negativity and, and fear, that's what will manifest. But if, we, if, we, if we're aware of that, but we put it over there and we, we give all our energy to, to live in the lives we want to live and create in the world we want to live in, that's what will manifest because that's how it works, you know. We create, we create the future. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, yeah, we can all uh, do that together, you know. Yeah, and I've done I've done posts on the science behind this because people say that's all kind of law of attraction nonsense, but actually the quantum mechanics, quantum physics, also says the same thing that it's our Absolutely. perception and our worldview that is co our collective worldview that is creating the reality that we see out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't agree more, man. You know. All right. So just to finish off, uh, so with the websites, you've mentioned a few already. Um, the music website. So what I what I do with my music, 
I start off with demos. You know, I lived I lived on the road in the van for 10 years. Uh, so I didn't have a recording studio or anything. So I used to do a lot of what I call camper van demos. So I have a site called freemanmusic.org. And, and that's like my works in progress. They, there's all sorts of terrible recordings on there and really basic demos in the van and some and some much better things, but they're all at different stages of evolution. So everything goes on there to start with, like the pipeline, you know. But now I'm kind of, I have a base here and I, I have a, some great musicians around me and, and more capacity to record better. You know, I'm, I'm releasing those songs that I get finished uh, on projectfreemanmusic.net, okay? So, but you can, get, you can get to it all through my litmusafreeman.net homepage as well, you know. So, so the, I've finished about 14 tracks now, including Free Man, which I just released, like, on the new moon. You know, I always release on new moons and new... Uh, new sun signs <laughs> um so there's 14 tracks kind of more studio quality uh and they're on all the main platforms so they're on Bandcamp and soundcloud but also like spotify and tidal and youtube music and apple and all of those things you know i had i had some internal debate about that you know being into freedom and stuff do i want to be part of that whole corporate music stuff but it's just basically so that more people can access your your material, you know. That's the same so reason. Yeah. That's the same reason I'm going to put uh, going to be putting these interviews on YouTube as well. Right. Is because more more people will reach more people that are on the journey. The people that you know we're we're all kind of waiting for the whole of man, of mankind or humankind to wake up. More people can access the information. So it's a compromise, you know. I could say, oh. I'm into freedom and I don't believe in corporations and I'm not going to put anything on, you know, Spotify because they rip off musicians and they never give us any money and they exploit our material. All of that's true, but, you know, they have 90 million songs and, and millions and millions of people able to access music there. So at least if you're on there, you know, that's a bit of a compromise because it gives more people access. Yeah, or another way to look at it is using these, you know, controlling systems to uh, bring down the controlling system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's like that with money, you know, because, you know, we could say, I mean, I totally understand money is debt and now it all works. And, um, and for a while I said, you know, don't use money and do something else as much as possible. I, I love to do exchanges, you know. So I give people free astrology kind of readings and advice and I, I play music for free, but you know, you give me something else in return and hopefully not money. But if you're like me and you used to work in the corporate world and you've got some income coming out of that evil matrix because of all that work you did back in the past, if you can use that money for really great things now outside the matrix, you know, to really benefit people like, like buying lands that your friends can live on and things like that. You know, that's a good use. It's, it's a bit like money laundering, but in a good way, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, um, it's like taking the money from the evil and giving it to the love, you know, rather than just chopping it off and saying, I'm not going to touch that stuff, you know, use it for some good, you know? Yeah, this is also a recent realization of mine as well, you know, because once you go down those rabbit holes and you you figure out how money works, then you're, oh, yeah, money's evil. Um, and, and that's actually quite a limiting belief, I think, for people that are trying to do good, you know, that, that have gone through the, the waking up process and are trying to do good in the world because you need money to be able – you know, the, the more abundance you have as far as, you know, feeling healthy, living in a nice, clean, healthy environment, whatever, and, and being able to buy good food or have buy your land to grow your food, then you can uh, you can you're going to be in a better space and a better place to be contributing good to the world. So absolutely. Yeah. 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 So I've gone through that 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 kind of transition myself now into 
having money is not the problem. The problem is like what what is what is what is that money being used for? Exactly. All of these things are benign in nature. They're just tools. Um, and it's how you use them that matters. Yeah. If you 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 can use them, you know, in you can be enlightened about uh, how the universe works, and you can use that. You can go into the dark arts, you know, and go to the dark side <laughs> to exploit that that knowledge and experience. Or you can walk in the light, and you can use it for positive things, you know. But but the knowledge itself is neither good or evil. It's just awareness and knowledge, you know, and and you, and it's yeah, it's how you use it that matters. So so. Take some of these things that they've created for evil purposes and use them for good purposes. And like say, up yours, guys, you know, ha, 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 I'm using it for good, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking with me. We've pretty much managed two hours, which is amazing. But there's <laughs> so much in it. And I really feel like this is a powerful interview for people that are you know, exploring this topic of what it means to be free. Because, you know, we've just talked, for example, about money. We've talked about to what extent it makes sense to completely step out, not step out, um, peeling off the onion layers. And, um, yeah, I'm sure that when we get this interview out there, that the, the people in the CPN community and other people that, that come across this will be really interested in doing some workshops or something with, uh, with the calendar, for example. Dude, you just, we're like, we I call this cosmic waves, you know, it's like we're on, we're reading each other's minds. I was just thinking about my workshops. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a thing called Wisdom Workouts. So these are workshops I do on all of these topics that we talked about and some others. Um, so if, if there is anyone watching this, you know, and you've, you know, things like my calendar, my music, these things are really ideal for for new emerging communities and people, new tribes and new new regenerative communities and you know people who are doing who are walking into the new world and creating the world we want to live in. You know, um, so if you if you've got a group like that somewhere, obviously for me, if you're in Portugal, this is great because I can easily get to you. But you know, if if you cover my my cost to get there. And, and give me some hookups some of my van and uh, and uh, and a bit of water and and a bit of food you know I'll come and give you a workshop um, and that's great because then we can really interact and get and get all the good stuff flowing and I, I do that a lot you know I'm I'm currently looking at doing an, another astrology workshop fairly soon so here so yeah if there's anyone watching who would like a, a free man wisdom workout you know uh, let me know. Well, I'll come and I'll I'll come and join you face to face for a wisdom workout when we finally get back to Portugal. <laughs> All right, well, it'd be great to see you back here, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for the interview. Um, and yeah, any last words? Ah, I was even thinking before we did the interview. I'm, I wonder if I'll get him to to play with it. <laughs> Cause I'm a free man. website <laughs> thank you very much amazing i'll talk to you soon cheers man thank you so much and keep keep doing what you're doing it's doing a lot of good yeah and we'll be in contact we'll stay we're in contact anyway uh thank you so much peace love and freedom man <laughs> <laughs>